World War I cost the lives of millions of men in the trenches of the Western Front, from Europe to Gallipoli on the Turkish Peninsula. Battles raged in the Middle East, Africa, and other regions across the world. These men experienced the brutality of war. Military chaplain Thomas Tattersall described an experience he had at the beginning of the first Somme offensive in 1916. Dawn opened with the song of birds. I listened to their hymn of praise. Thousands of men with limbs a quiver and loud beating hearts were waiting not far away for the signal to engage in battle. At 0500 hours, the bombardment of German lines began and it seemed as if 10,000 demons of hell had been let loose in an ungovernable rage. Men of faith serving in the Great War found themselves facing the gruesome reality of war. Men of peace, in the midst of conflict, tasked with the well-being and spiritual needs of the soldier. In this four-part series, we look at the courage and conviction of chaplains who served on the battlefields of the Great War. We highlight the dedicated work of religious societies and organizations such as the YMCA, Salvation Army, Scripture Gift Mission, and many others. The Bible was the book most widely read by the soldiers. We look at the effect it had on them in the trenches. The events leading up to World War I came from tensions between the European powers who were in a race to establish their dominance. Alliances had been formed which split Europe into two major camps. All it needed was a spark. That spark was the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, heir to the throne of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Consequently, a series of alliances were invoked, plunging Europe into war. Austria-Hungary invaded Serbia. Russia mobilized to aid Serbia, and Germany invaded neutral Belgium before moving towards France, leading Britain to declare war on Germany on the 4th of August, 1914. The German march in Paris was soon halted. This line of defense became known as the Western Front. It became a battle of attrition with a trench line. By November, 1914, the Ottoman Empire joined Germany and the Austro-Hungarian Empire, opening fronts in the Caucasus and the Middle East. Into this clash of empires we find men of the cross, going where the soldier is sent. Military chaplains have had a long history within the armed services. Right from the time of Joshua in the Old Testament, spiritual leaders have been actively involved with the military. Centuries later, Christian clerics were deployed with their forces as combatants. In the 1300s, clerics began to be deployed more formally as chaplains, their role increasingly becoming more focused on the spiritual. The Army Chaplains Department was later established in 1796. Chaplaincy isn't a singular solid entity in the British Army during the period leading up to the First World War. There are various agencies providing pastoral and religious care for the British soldier. Um, there is the Army Chaplains Department, which looks after British soldiers in the British Isles, the British mainland, and some of the colonies. But then again, there is also the Indian Ecclesiastical Establishment, which looks after British soldiers in India. Added to that, there are various local arrangements throughout the empire and indeed throughout uh, Great Britain itself, arrangements with local clergy, with missionary clergy, etc. So chaplaincy care is very mixed in terms of its composition. 
Before World War I, military chaplaincy uh, effectively mirrored uh, the life of the civilian church. Uh, the most important thing, of course, was that the army had compulsory church parades. So something like 95% of its uh, soldiers would have declared themselves as Christian, belonging to either uh, the Church of England, uh, Presbyterian Church, the Catholic Church, or one of the English Free Churches. Um, and they were effectively marched to one of their churches on a Sunday morning. And that was the most significant and central feature of the, the work of an army chaplain. The Scottish units were largely Presbyterian, the English units were largely Church of England, and the Irish units were largely Catholic. The problem for the Wesleyans and the other smaller denominations is that they might have men in the army, but they never had them in sufficient concentrations. Of course, that all changed in 1914, because Kit Kitchener appeals for a million men to join the new army. They began to receive volunteers from Baptist, Congregationalist, independent groups of one kind or another, Salvationists. And to look after the spiritual needs in 1914, a, a number of non-conformist chaplains joined the forces. But it wasn't until 1915 that an organisation was established to oversee and manage uh, non-conformist care and support of chaplaincy within the army, and that was the United Board. They represented primarily Baptist, Congregationalist, Primitive and United Methodists. But they're quite willing to take under their umbrella a number of other smaller denominations. And underneath the United Board, they're able to spread non-conformist chaplains throughout the army, being able to represent the spiritual needs of non-conformist soldiers. The army decided to send 55 chaplains to France um, with the British Expeditionary Force in August 1914. Um, and that wasn't enough to provide each of the regiments and battalions uh, with their own chaplain. Um, so the decision was taken that they would serve with the medical units, uh, with field ambulances which would accompany the uh, frontline troops and in the hospitals. Many of them were involved in helping out with surgical teams, assisting um, in surgical theatres. Others were involved in looking after the patients at field hospitals and some were involved in stretcher bearing and uh, coordinating stretcher bearing. The situation in terms of expectation for these ministers and priests does differ to a certain extent according to their tradition. Obviously Catholic chaplains are expected to administer the sacraments. Uh, the expectation of uh, all chaplains, however, is to lead um, public services and also to bury the dead. And these are the two uh, defining expectations actually mentioned in King's regulations. Everything else in terms of the role of the chaplain is a development of military experience and an extension of civilian practice. The chaplain's main job was the spiritual guidance to service personnel, that's why they were there. They were there as representatives of their churches and denominations to make sure that the spiritual aspect of the church was being continued whilst they were at war. There wasn't a, a, a handbook for chaplains before World War I. During the course of the war, various people tried to write some instructions and by 1917 they were getting the new recruits together um, to give them some insight into what they might meet. In the early part of the war, you would be interviewed at the War Office by the appropriate person, usually the Chaplain General if you're an Anglican, um, and he, if he liked you, would say, OK, you're in, go and buy some kit, uh, and a couple of days later you could be on the uh, boat to France, at which point you'd get sent direct to your unit. So for these people, it was uh, literally a baptism of fire. The trench system, which is such a familiar icon of um, World War I, really didn't start on the Western Front until November uh, 1914. Before that, the war had been quite fluid, a war of movement. Prior to the battles, we know from the work of people like the Wesleyan Owen Watkins that before the Battle of Lakato, he was visiting them in the position, the troops in the positions that they had taken up, waiting for the battle. When the battle starts, he has to make his way back to the field ambulance to be ready to receive the casualties that are coming through. Uh, but he's then heavily involved in the tactical withdrawal um, as the army pulls back. Uh, he loses contact with his field ambulance because he's so heavily involved with groups of stragglers 
um, and is responsible for gathering up men and encouraging them to uh, uh, continue with the army rather than just falling out and um, waiting to be taken prisoner. Chaplains have always, under the Geneva Convention, been required to wear um, an armband with a red cross on it, or indeed a red star, um, and along with other medical personnel so that they can be identified. And the Geneva Convention has rules for those who have signed it about the way you treat medical personnel. Ben O'Rourke, who was one of two chaplains who stayed with the wounded after the Battle of Mons uh, in the end of August 1914, was quite convinced that he was not going to be made a prisoner, uh, that he would immediately be exchanged and sent back to the British lines, and was quite indignant when he was marched off into Germany. He wrote a book about his experiences because a year later he was exchanged. And interestingly, of course, by that point in July 1915, he didn't want to be exchanged because he'd come to recognise that, that a chaplain had a ministry to prisoners um, and that if he was exchanged there wouldn't necessarily be anybody uh, acting as padre in the prison camps. Faster, faster, they're on the Chaplains serving in the Western Front were faced with a very different type of war than expected. They found themselves very quickly coming under fire. It was going to take a very brave and courageous person to be a military chaplain on the front line. Chaplain E.L. Watson described his experience of moving forward with his stretcher bearers to collect the wounded. He wrote, On account of the constant sweep of rifle fire by day, it's impossible to remove the poor fellows until night, when the difficult and dangerous work begins. The average trench is only about two feet wide by six feet deep. Carrying wounded men through these winding passages past the riflemen in pitch darkness means agony for the patients and grave trouble to the stretcher bearers. Watson also confesses. Shell fire did not try my nerves as severely as the cracks of the rifle followed by the ping of the bullet. That reminded one of the fact that an enemy's eye was constantly waiting for a good sight of you. Shells come by chance to the individual, but these bullets, by deliberate aim. Tian Tazel, who's well known for being explosive, uh, probably why he got a nickname TNT. He was a man willing to risk everything for his soldiers, and he tells of one instance where there is an outgoing bombardment. The British guns were, were firing, and he was in a trench like this with his, his guys. He's looking down the trench uh, as he was doing it, and he describes what he sees. And he says that soldiers were burying their faces into the sandbags, that some were weeping, some were shaking, uh, some were, were, were finding it hard to cope. And that was the bombardment going over just before an offensive. So he as a chaplain was right there with them. But what he describes as not nice, calm, relaxed soldiers, but soldiers who are absolutely uh, under significant stress. And it was almost a relief, you get the impression, to have the whistle blow and to go over the top, because waiting just seemed to be so hard. But waiting with them was their padre. Help! The frontline role of the British Army chaplain on the Western Front is greatly complicated by an early war prohibition on chaplains serving in the front line. Obviously chaplains don't carry rifles and also it's deemed to be potentially demoralising to have lots of dead chaplains lying around. So there is a prohibition um, which emanates from the Secretary of State for War, Lord Kitchener, on chaplains actually entering the front line and this holds from uh, the summer of 1914 through to the spring of 1916. But what's very interesting is that this is a, uh, a regulation, this is a stipulation which is very widely violated by individual chaplains who were very anxious to be seen at the front, very anxious to be seen ministering in the frontline trenches. One of the big debates in the Catholic community was precisely where should a chaplain serve? Because if he's with a relatively small group of people in, in the trench line, you can't see a thousand men all at the same time, usually, once they're dispersed in the trenches. Um, you're actually going to minister to a relatively small group of people. Whereas if you're in the casualty evacuation chain, you're at the point at which, particularly for Catholics, these men may be dying and they need the, a priest to be with them. Where do you go? Um, and the only answer to that was to increase the number of chaplains. And so all of the churches, certainly from the end of 1914 onwards, were lobbying to increase the number of chaplains, simply so they could get more chaplains further forward. 
One of the most dangerous areas during the trench warfare of the First World War was, of course, in no man's land, between the German lines and between the uh, Allied lines. And often they would go forward into this area under heavy fire, shell fire, uh, machine gun fire, uh, mortars and all kinds of things uh, going off around them uh, to, to retrieve the wounded. And George Smithson and Herbert Legate were two that were highly honoured for retrieving uh, the wounded under fire continually. Uh, as well as actually staying with those who are dying. And there are some stories of chaplains staying with soldiers who are not wounded, but they're trapped in the Somme mud. And they couldn't move, they couldn't be extricated. They just had to stay there and slowly suffocate. And uh, the chaplains would sometimes lay down on the ground flat with them, hold the hand until they passed away so they wouldn't be left alone. Padre William Cram Charteris uh, believed passionately that it was a Christian's birthright to be courageous. Uh, and therefore chaplains as Christians and examples of the faith had the obligation to demonstrate courage in the face of severe challenge or difficulty or even threat of death and injury. Uh, and that was very common, not just with this one individual chaplain, but right along the board of all the different denominations, there was a real desire to show physical as well as moral courage so that the soldiers would be encouraged in the just fight uh, that uh, the church believed they were entering in. W.P. Rhodes, a United Methodist chaplain, made the point that If a chaplain first thought of his own skin, he'd better stay at home, for his duty takes him constantly amidst danger. Chaplain E.L. Watson described his approach in the Baptist Times. I simply go where I'm needed most and can serve the men best. Trenches advanced dressing stations, field hospitals and rest camps. Chaplains were there carrying their cross and their Bible. And that was very apparent to many people, that they were there amongst the thick of it, with their soldiers, completely insecure in a way, but also secure in their faith and their mission to support their soldiers. They were not meant to be right at the front. They certainly weren't meant to be part of um, the action that was going on. They were meant to be part of the support for that and to help those after the battle particularly. But there are instances and examples of some chaplains who did go over the top with their soldiers to provide comfort and uh, help for those who were wounded and to provide the last rites to those young men who died on the battlefield. I don't think that it was expected of any of them to do that. But those examples that uh, we can see are certainly examples of courage, both moral courage and physical courage, in the face of uh, huge um, adversity. If you're there and you make sense, then people will respond to you because they're under pressure and they're looking for answers. Um, and I've always said, at uh, my experience as 25 years as an army chaplain, that soldiers are religious people because they ask the great questions of life, who am I, where did I come from, and most of all, where am I going? In a way that you don't necessarily ask in the settled life of a, a peacetime existence. And if you can help to provide an answer to those questions, then you've got some, some significance and some value. There is a very moving story of a medical officer and a chaplain out in no man's land after an attack, trying to locate the wounded and bring them back during the hours of darkness and a British soldier is discovered and he says to them, he's wounded, which one of you is the chaplain? And the chaplain identifies himself and this soldier puts his arm around the chaplain and basically is delighted to see him because as the story goes, his world had been a world of isolation and pain. And here is the chaplain, here is the clergyman, here is the representative of the church in no man's land here to look after him. And that's a very powerful story and I think it's a story and a scenario that should be better known in understanding what the work of the chaplain entailed in the front line in these conditions. One of the things that happened during the First World War was that a lot more clergy started to wear dog collars. Uh, it hadn't necessarily been all that common, particularly in the English free churches. And I think one of the things that caused the adoption of the, the clerical collar with the uniform was because it set them apart from other officers. And chaplains were commissioned and I think chaplains began to feel that when the front line became settled, the people needed to know when they were approaching, who they were. And of course the collar is a fairly good badge, it's, it stands out. 
uh, the difficulty is it also identifies you to the enemy if you're in sight of them as well. And in a sense, it's because behind that is a kind of active parable, which is saying that the war may be necessary, it may even, in terms of World War I, be legal, um, it may even, in terms of modern theory, be just, uh, but that it's not the only way of settling your disputes. Uh, of course, chaplains, many of them, bought into the fact that the British Empire in 1914 was going to war for a quite legitimate cause, um, and that they should, if you're going to fight a war, you should do it properly. I mean, you don't go, you don't go to war to lose it. There is a very touching story of an Anglican chaplain, the Honourable Maurice Peel, who had a habit before going over the top of basically communicating a biblical verse to the men as they stood in the trenches on the parapet waiting to go over. And the last one that he issued before he himself was killed was, remember that I will be with you, yes, even to the end of time. A story that helps us to understand how significant the Bible was to the soldiers of the Great War which were brought up in Christian homes right across the land uh, was a story that was related to us by Padre Coates of Bunyan's Meeting House. And he writes in his letters uh, that he promised a, a soldier a New Testament. And as he was coming along to deliver it on his bicycle, uh, as he approached the crossroads with a number of other soldiers present, the artillery began to open up on them and they all had to take uh, cover into a ditch and as the shells rained down, he had to decide whether or not he would risk life and limb to go across that crossroads to get this New Testament to the soldier that he had already promised, or whether he would just simply say it's too dangerous, uh, maybe another day, and come back later. He felt compelled to cut across the, the crossroads to get this New Testament to the soldier, because tomorrow the soldier might not need it, because he might be dead, and his eternal future might rest on it. So he cuts across the crossroads, he gets to the place where the soldier was, he gives them the New Testament and was able to give three others out as well. So he felt that it was very much worth his life and his limbs to actually get this to, to this young man. For the fighting men who were caught up in the devastation of World War I, there was one book that brought a measure of spiritual comfort and hope a pocket-sized New Testament. Bibles were given to soldiers by religious societies and groups to comfort them on active service. The Bible Society, YMCA, the Pocket Testament League, Scripture Gift Mission and the Naval and Military Bible Society were just some of those who distributed millions of New Testaments and Gospel literature during the First World War. Testaments like the World War I active service St John's Gospel were provided by Scripture Gift Mission and the Naval and Military Bible Society. They were designed to fit into the top pocket of uniforms. On the inside cover page was a copied handwritten message to the troops by Field Marshal Lord Roberts. It said, I ask you to put your faith in God. He will watch over you and strengthen you. You will find in this little book guidance when you are in health, comfort when you are in sickness, and strength when you are in adversity. Some soldiers wrote messages in them and even their wills. Testaments had hymn sheets at the back. They also had a page with a decision form and a space to declare faith in Christ, based on the Bible promise that as many as received Jesus, to them gave he power to become the sons of God even to them who believe on his name. Many people had, had their own Bibles or Testaments, particularly New Testaments, because they would slip into a, a uniform jacket pocket and took them with them. And I've seen over the last 10 or 15 years a number of men who've shown me their relative's uh, testament that was taken, and one particular one that came back from the Somme where its owner had been killed and had been treasured as part of the family relics, if you like, for that particular soldier. Some of those Bibles literally saved soldiers' lives. Private Frederick Peel of the 5th Battalion of the Border Regiment was carrying a Pocket Testament League Bible in his uniform pocket when he was hit by a German machine gun bullet. The bullet embedded in his Bible, saving his life. 
Private Jennison of the 5th Yorkshire Regiment was carrying a New Testament which stopped a bullet from piercing his chest. And there are many more reported stories like these. Coming up in World War I Military Chaplains Part 2, we look at chaplains serving in the Gallipoli Campaign who were under heavy fire and bombardment as the Allied invasion force was halted on the Turkish peninsula. <laughs> 